living on your carpet. It's Calibi! <laughs> Hi, I'm a YouTuber, and welcome to my nightmare. YouTube does not care about its creators. They care more about maintaining a clean corporate image. And this has been proven time and time again, but the most significant case was when they decided to delete Mumkey Jones' YouTube channel. Some might even say this isn't about Mumkey. This is about... The animal can be seen on video grabbing and dragging a little boy. But many say that he wasn't attacking the boy. In fact, he was just playing with him. Officials made the decision to shoot and kill him, saying that a tranquilizer dart would have been too risky. An endangered animal has been shot and killed at a zoo that was meant to protect him. Many have asked, why didn't you just tranquilize the animal? They stand by the decision that they made. Did they make the right decision? Monkey Jones was a YouTuber like any other, okay? He made amateur videos with his friends, and you can tell that he took a lot of pride in the work that he did. There's just one teensy weensy little problem. Where the heck is my Bible? Surely there's an answer in there. It's over on the bookshelf, but there's no way you're gonna make it. Oh, I'll make it, because I hold the Lord in my heart. He had an edgy sense of humor. 
okay? And he was not afraid to explore taboo subjects that most politically correct people would prefer to just pretend don't exist. There are certain topics that, you know, you would say like, I'm not gonna talk about that. That's like kicking a hornet's nest. Monkey Jones was the kind of person who, when you said that about a topic, like he, picks up the hornet's nest and pulls it open. <laughs> you see, while Monkey's content was definitely edgy, it was never malicious. He's trying to figure out what's the queen, what's the ideology here, let's figure out what it is and then, and then crush it. In fact, the videos that got him banned were the ones where he literally mocked the incel king himself, Elliot Rogers. Incel is involuntarily celibate, meaning you've tried many times and failed. Incels believe in a strange cosmology where a male archetype named Chad talks to women with ease and is rewarded with sex. Incels define themselves in opposition to this as too ugly or awkward and resent women for falling for the Chads of the world. Now, for those of you who don't know, Elliot Rogers is one of the most notorious school shooters around. Not because he was particularly successful or scary, mainly because of the opposite. He was a complete loser, in, in every sense of the word. Hi, Elliot Roger here. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity. You see, before he set out on his night of retribution, he released a manifesto and uploaded a few videos to YouTube. And in these pieces, he essentially revealed that he was a massive narcissist who genuinely believed that women owed him their bodies and affection. I'm 22 years old, and I'm still a virgin. I've never even kissed a girl. And it has been very torturous. It's not fair. You girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me. Uh, because you were a selfish, pathetic loser who had never held yourself accountable for any action, preferring to project your lack of success as being the fault of others for not providing it to you on a silver platter? But I will punish you all for- <laughs> It's an injustice, a crime, because I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy. Oh, oh, okay. A real sick guy, basically. So much so that he actually blamed his life's problems on women, and he sought to have innocent people pay the price for his loneliness. All those girls that I've desired so much, they would have all rejected me and looked down upon me as an inferior man if I ever made a sexual advance towards them. Now thankfully, his night of retribution was pretty much completely botched, okay? Nothing went according to plan. He did, however, kill a few people, so it, it is sad, don't, don't kid yourself. But when Monkey Jones decided to start a series where he dissected the mind of Elliot Roger, he wasn't doing it so that he could encourage or promote the hilariously disconnected ideologies of the kid. No, he was straight up mocking him. Phase 2, War on Women. It wasn't just beautiful, sexually active people that Elliot wanted symbolic revenge against. He also wanted to declare war against women in general. What I would want to say about about Monkey and, and him dealing with, with the Rogers meme yeah. is that they, yeah. that's a topic that like it seems pretty off limits. And But something that everyone wonders about that is like, why did he do it and what's causing this? Why is it happening more frequently? The purpose of this video is to cut through the political bull and to answer these questions once and for all. Why did this tragedy happen, and what can be done to prevent similar tragedies from happening in the future? And Mumkey, he reads the manifesto and he figures out, okay, what was he trying to accomplish? In essence, because no girl had ever asked him out on a date, Elliot intended to massacre an entire sorority house full of women. And then, can we make fun of that? And he marches up to the door and turns the handle and... It's locked. And he made fun of the entire thing. So he does what anybody holding a gun would do when faced with a locked door. He knocks on it. For several minutes. He just uploaded a video saying he was going to shoot up this sorority house and he has to know that the police will be there any minute. And he's standing at the door knocking for several minutes. Hey, excuse me. Uh, wicked heartless bitches? Yeah, would you mind letting me in so I can slaughter all of you like the animals you are? Hello? Oh, rats. Rejected again. So by the end of it, you end up thinking, like, this guy's a loser and an incel, and he's not, like, this badass uh, hero who got vengeance, which is what he wanted everyone to think. 
you mm-hmm. know? So, like, those guys who do shocking things and, and hurt people, they want to be, like, seen as suddenly a badass. Mm. And Monkey, what he did is he kind of, like, broke that fantasy apart and said, like, no, this guy's, like, a loser who used the cheapest way, you know? Because otherwise, you're, it's kind of more scary. Yeah. You know? You're like, why are these people doing that? Let's figure out why and let's make fun of it. It is shocking. And, but there's a lot of art that's challenging enough that you feel shocked when you see it. And Monkey's definitely like that. But the point here is, for the third phase in a row, Elliot has failed drastically. Each and every time he has a plan to kill specific people, and he fails to do so. Will Elliot have a stroke of good luck in the final phase? <laughs> what the f- do you think violence in schools whatever reason they're attracted to if they're looking it up on youtube and they come away thinking that guy's a huge loser that's better for all of us yeah. like in no reality did someone with half a brain watch monkey's videos and think that he was glorifying the idiocy of elliot rogers but you see despite the fact that monkey's videos were very clearly satirical despite the fact that monkey had stopped making videos about elliot months prior and despite the fact that youtube manually reviewed his content and approved it for monetization multiple times on december 11th of 2018 Monkey Jones was erased from the platform without any warning. channel that made a lot of videos about Elliot Roger, but he generally made it in the sense of making fun of him. From what I can tell, he's uploaded these videos for a while, and then all of a sudden, he received six community guideline strikes on two of his channels, resulting in their termination. They could have just deleted the videos or age restricted them, or but why remove the channel? Within a day, his gaming channel was gone, and within a week, all four of the new accounts created by his friends and girlfriend were also removed. For all intents and purposes, he was completely blacklisted. About two or three years ago, I think it was three years ago now, I would post just uh, audio logs here talking about my experiences with depression and thoughts of suicide, and that ultimately spawned the, the live show podcast, The Depression Chamber, where people do similar things anonymously. And I read their stories. And I thought I would bring it back today because I I think it's fair to say I am at the lowest point in my life. Lost my dream career. Had all of my channels taken down. And I know it's been literally five months since that happened. And I should have moved on by now. It shouldn't still be on my mind every day. Because really, it's a YouTube channel. How pathetic could a person be to really care about that? But to have had so much success in a field that I always dreamed of being in, and to have it stripped away so fast, it's hard to get over it. <sighs> but I've I've been really struggling. I just want to make videos that make people laugh and I've been making a lot of self-destructive decisions because uh, the uh, the depression and the suicidal thoughts they they came back in full
Alright, so before I get into the uh, juicy bits, let me explain the strikes. At the time the monkey was deleted, it worked that once you get three strikes, your channel's removed. Now usually it worked that one strike was like a warning, a second strike was for a repeated offense, and then a third strike was for breaking the rules continually. Monkey received six strikes in one day. Three on his main channel, and three on his second channel. And, to add insult to injury, YouTube incorporated the system where you now get an extra warning on top of the three strikes. We know that most of the time creators don't break the rules intentionally and just want to get back to making great content. So we're giving everybody a warning the very first time they post content that crosses the line with no penalty to their channel. Meaning that really you need four strikes to get terminated. This is to make sure everyone takes the time to learn about our community guidelines and understands what went wrong before they face more severe consequences. Imagine Mumkey's reaction when this was introduced, just like a few months after he got taken down. But okay, you know, you might be thinking, well, what did this guy do, right? Like, he must have broken the rules pretty badly. Well, let's take a look at the strikes. My Twisted World, the story of Elliot Roger by Elliot Roger. This was an audiobook version of uh, that incel we talked about, his manifesto. Mumkey reads it word for word, not adding any commentary or opinion of his own. All of my suffering on this world has been at the hands of humanity, particularly women. Now on the surface level, that might sound kind of bad, right? But just think about it this way. This is completely normal practice. If you look for an audiobook version of Hitler's Mein Kampf, you're gonna find it on YouTube. If you're looking for Elliot's Manifesto, guess what? You can find it anywhere. It was literally published by the New York Times. It's also been directly referred to and linked by the Washington Post, Vice, USA Today, and the LA Times, among many others. So nothing that documents or shares this hilariously narcissistic manifesto should ever be considered hate speech. Things like this should be publicized because it's a perfect raw look into the mind of a delusional killer. You know, the event happened, we can't undo that, but by documenting it, we can at least try to learn from it. And I think YouTube kind of agrees with this because when Monkey confronted them about this on Twitter, they stopped responding entirely. So that's a garbage strike. This world we live in is twisted. There's no denying that. Women reject the sophisticated, nice guys like us. It's unjust and it's unfair. Luckily, before he died in a heroic final act of retribution, St. Elliot Roger wrote a blueprint for what society should become in order to make the world a better place. Okay, this is definition satire. Just so you understand the context, in Elliot Rogers' manifesto, there's a section near the end where he outlines his golden plan for humanity. Where he basically just drones on about how sex is the ultimate evil and that in order to stop sex, we should just eradicate all women. Sexuality will completely cease to exist. Love will cease to exist. It is the only way to purify the world. And Monkey, being the satirist that he is, took that and made it funny. This is perfectly logical reasoning. As scientists have proved time and time again, human sexuality isn't a naturally occurring evolutionary trait. Men only want to have sex because of the presence of females. If women aren't around, then men will literally never feel the desire for sex. And they'll definitely never feel love. He basically just played along with Elliot's stupidity while simultaneously pointing out the obvious logical fallacies. Some might argue that in this scenario there would be a huge boom in homosexual relationships, but we're just gonna have to trust Elliot's judgment on this one since we can't ask him for clarification. So the intention here was very clearly to mock Elliot and to be funny, not to promote hate speech. If we come together, we can untwist this twisted world. Or we can just play World of Warcraft in our bedroom for 14 hours a day and wonder, huh, I wonder why I don't have a girlfriend. Only an algorithm would be capable of taking this seriously.
This one is literally a minute long fake movie trailer Mumkey made by compiling clips that Elliot Rogers uploaded to YouTube himself. They're cringy clips that Mumkey and his friends used to further mock how much of a disconnected narcissist this guy was. It was obviously satirical and definitely did not contain any graphic or violent images. This is especially ironic because if you look up Elliot Roger the movie trailer, there's a video with over 200,000 views that actually contains footage from the shooting. But no, Monkeys is the one with all the graphic and violent images, yeah, okay. Will Mumkey become a Elliot? This this is another one where I can just play a clip. Do this quiz to find out whether you are a suitable school shooter or not. Do you ever harm yourself? No, pathetic. But I guess I'll have to go with no by default because I don't do it. Do you ever feel extreme feelings of isolation or social withdrawal? Um, I mean, I, I do feel lonely, but I, it's something that I don't really... It doesn't bother me as much as it used to just because I do live with a person now. There's literally nothing wrong with it. I mean, was it was it the premise? Him taking a completely unserious test to see if he's a school shooter? Okay, maybe, but it definitely wasn't encouraging or promoting violent or dangerous acts. Oh, uh, what does this mean? Oh, you're kind of school shooty, but not 100%. <laughs> This poor fucking guy. Does he have any idea that his image of him in a fedora is being used as the you're almost a school shooter result? Hmm. You know what? That does sound like encouraging violent acts to me. Psst. Hey, algorithm. That was sarcasm. I suggest you read up on it, big guy. This one is honestly insane, okay? Like, this should worry you. Just wrap your head around this, okay? A video that was set to private, as in had zero views, nobody had seen it, was used to take down Monkey Jones' channel. I mean, this is absolute proof that this was a calculated witch hunt. They wanted him dead, and they did not care how sloppy they got with it. The contents of the video really don't matter because it was private. Nobody saw it. It was just another satirical Elliot Rogers video that Mumkey uploaded as a test. It was initially made to conclude his Elliot Rogers series and was basically a music video of him theatrically rejecting the killer, much like all the women that he cried about in his manifesto. You were my best friend. I mean, come on, that, that has some artistic value, that's poetry. Now, of course, this harmless music video was interpreted as him encouraging or promoting violent or dangerous acts. Now, this is a good time to remind you that the majority of these videos were manually approved for monetization, meaning that a YouTube employee watched them and decided that they were worthy of having advertisements play on them. Also, these videos were up for months and even years before Monkey got striked for them. And the fact that a private video got targeted is just, like, that's insane. This one is completely not serious. It, it involves no nudity, no sexual content, aside from Monkey saying that perfume smells like a little boy. Now, if you know anything about mail time videos on YouTube, you'd know that they have a tendency of getting, uh, weird. <laughs> This guy sent us a baby tooth that he lost. Oh. It's taped right there and it says it should still have blood on it. <coughs> hey Max, I often wondered why anyone hasn't sent you their sperm yet. So to be the first, here it is. Uh, there is some fluid at the bottom. I don't know. No way. Oh, are you serious? This is literally a bag of shit. <coughs> 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 Uh, it's basically a used bong with a minion on it. So when a viewer sent Monkey a mysterious perfume from Japan that smelt like pheromones, of course he's gonna joke about it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty Yes, yeah, that's what I'm saying! Now you might think that's bad or worthy of being punished, but... Well, let's take a look at some... Now this may or may not come as a surprise, but YouTube is riddled with porn. And the staff are okay with it. With just a few clicks, you can find full-length erotic movies, masturbation coaching videos, flashlight reviews, you name it. So long as there's not full-on... 
then you're good to upload it. <laughs> well, hello, little piggy. <laughs> mm, I just want to shove my foot down in your mouth. Stroke it faster, little piggy. Come for me, little piggy. I did try to insert this toy, but you know, it's going to take me a while. Hard Rock Hotel hosts the AVN Expo, which is a wild three-day event to showcase the heavy hitters of the adult industry. Here is Laura. I'll show you how to suck your woman's pussy like a boss right now. So as you're licking here, you can have a finger in there and rubbing her G-spot like this. It's just two, two inches inside the vagina here. The way the vast majority of these channels survive is because they tag their videos as educational or art. I mean, I can't say I understand the artfulness of a bunch of middle-aged men crowding around a chick who's reluctantly spreading her legs, but sure, YouTube, I guess you can have that one. Oh. This one is so blatant, man. Like, how did YouTube staff only age restrict this? The woman is fully on display, all the guy's faces are censored, and there's a literal link to a weird looking website in the corner. Obviously, it does not belong on YouTube. And this isn't me just cherry picking the worst looking ones, okay? There is a very clear pattern here. I mentioned the erotic movies from before. There are thousands of erotic movies that get millions upon millions of views. And because I guess in the most vague context they could be taken as art, YouTube just allows them on their website. Despite the fact that there's constant full frontal sex scenes and that the titles literally include the word erotic. This channel gained over 300,000 subscribers just from uploading a handful of old erotic movies. Two of the uploads are actually the same movie. More recently, this guy gained over 250,000 subscribers over one video. And as you can guess, and as the title would suggest, these films are just straight up softcore porn. The literal first frame of this one contains nudity and the whole opening is just a BDSM sex scene. And YouTube staff have obviously approved of it because it has over 60 million views. Here's a channel that's dedicated to a TV show that is purely full frontal nudity. Here's a video that's literally just a dude pulling back his foreskin. Check on that channel and, well, look at their top viewed videos. Just a bunch of dudes pulling back their foreskins. I cannot properly demonstrate to you how lenient they are. It's just impossible to encapsulate in a video. I will leave a link in the pinned comment of this video so that you can see this for yourself. But just know as a general rule that YouTube does not enforce their policies on sexual content. Massage videos are also a haven for this kind of stuff with so much of the content you'll find being the prelude to an existing adult film. And the same applies for personalities. There are hundreds of subcultures that consist of women making subtly perverted content and then promoting their Patreon or premium Snapchat, where the actual porn hides behind a paywall. Hey guys, welcome to another try on video. Um, if you want to see the sexier version of a lot of these videos, head over to Patreon. Um, first link in the description below. Super cute. You could wear this with no shirt underneath for Patreon. I could wear this with no shirt underneath for Patreon, yes, yes. That would be sexy. That is a great idea, head over to Patreon. <laughs> the back, <laughs> super cute. <laughs> Wanna see more of this, head over to Patreon.com. <laughs> Don't forget about Patreon, there'll be a sexier version of that, of this, on there. Oh yeah. Yes. And honestly, I can kind of understand why YouTube turns a blind eye to the vast majority of this content. It's because it's harmless, you know? Outside of tugging your Twinkie too tight, there's really not much damage that can be done. I mean, hey, they'll take that watch time. I mean, they stand to gain much more by leaving it up than the amount that it would cost for them to take it down. But then let's look at Mumkey. His video that included no nudity, no sexually explicit themes, and that was not made to sexually gratify viewers, was striked down as sexually explicit content. Why? Well, they wanted him gone. And they didn't care how little sense it made because it's their platform and they can enforce, you know, whatever rules they want. But there's one thing that is very important when you start enforcing rules, and that is consistency. If Monkey is gonna get striked for something as harmless as this, but people can go on and make actually sexually explicit content, well then your rules mean nothing. But Chris, look at the title, man. They probably striked him because it seemed like pedophilia. Oh, don't even get me started on pe <laughs> Yeah. 
YouTube treats borderline pedophile channels better than they do edgy content creators. And Monkey is proof. Now before I get into this, I need to make it clear that pedophilia is a dangerous subject on this website. When people think that they've sniffed out a pedophile, it's often their first instinct to go, Time after time we've seen people jump the gun on pedophile accusations and it almost always ends messy. But a few months ago a dude named Matt came out with a video where he exposed a pedophilia problem that was occurring in the comments section of kids YouTube videos. I have discovered a wormhole as I would call it into a softcore pedophile ring on YouTube. Basically by using the algorithm and looking up harmless gymnastics or dancing videos you can enter a loop where the algorithm is recommending you videos of little kids recording themselves playing or whatever. And that's all fine, but when you go to the comments of these videos, they just all kind of brigade the video, and what they do is they timestamp. And the timestamps are the points in the video where the little girls are in compromising positions, sexually implicit positions. Now this Matt dude, God rest his soul, made the big mistake of targeting his outrage toward advertisers and news outlets. Tell everybody about this. Show people. Send it to local news outlets. Send it to BuzzFeed, whoever. So what I have done is I've compiled evidence of big brands like Dodge Ram, uh, McDonald's, Disney, Lysol, Grammarly. I can't imagine what these brands are going to say about their content appearing on these kinds of videos. Essentially, he wanted to drop the nukes, okay? He wanted to start the second adpocalypse, which would basically just ruin the livelihoods of many, many, many creators. He also live streamed his attempts to do this, and uh, the end result was messy, to say the least. It's weird to say, but I want to make it look bad for YouTube. I want to make it look very bad for YouTube. A YouTube advertiser responded, um, for real? Oh! Yes, man. Yes. Dude, that's what I'm talking about. That's so awesome. That's so awesome right now. That is great. That's great. That hits them where it hurts. Yes. Yes. Thanks for bringing it to our attention, Jamie. Our team is aware and investigating this material. <sighs> yes. Good. Now look, the battle is still ongoing. Awesome. Now again, look, guys. This means that YouTubers are going to suffer, unfortunately. Wow. For real? Yeah, well, you know what, dude? I guess what that shows is that you don't care. You care more about money than you do about protecting people, you know? So what if it affects you? Go work at KFC, bro. Wow. You care more about your money. This guy, I don't like this dude. How you doing, man? Good, how are you? I sent your video to the head of uh, YouTube Gaming, and I said, listen, you know, we let's get this taken care of. But then I, I saw you go on to say, there's ads attached to this, and we need to get in contact with as many news people as possible, and we need to take YouTube down. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're gonna have, you know, YouTubers that have nothing to do with any of this, their livelihood's gonna be affected by this. Like, this could cause another apocalypse and, where, and will be bad for everybody. Your message has already gotten to YouTube. Okay, okay? cool. The video had 30,000 um, views mm. and we sent it to YouTube. YouTube already acknowledged to me that they're on it. Now, I chose not to blow this story up. I chose not to cover it on Drumler and talk about it and make a big deal about this because I know what the consequences of that is. You know, I, I hear you and all I'm going to say is that those videos should absolutely not be monetized. What is up, Troubler Nation? I'm your host, Killer Keemstar. Something is going on in the YouTube community that is bothering me, and it's bothering many other YouTubers. It's a whole campaign, and it's called hashtag wake up YouTube. And it all started from a guy known as Matt Watson. Who is this guy? Well, remember when he said he didn't have a Twitter? He had a Twitter. And on this Twitter, there was some very, very creepy stuff. Why did this guy lie to me? What is he trying to hide? And that's when we found Matt's original YouTube channel. There's a schoolgirl walking down the side of the street. My name's Matt. You know, like filming some porn would be sick. And Matt pulls up to her in a car. I'm getting laid tonight. 
asking her. Interested in shooting an ad adult video? Absolutely disgusting. Taking my daily dose of red pill. Very, very creepy. Opening up. I'm a new man now. Very, very creepy. The guy's a troll. I have a YouTube channel where I make comedy videos. Whether you objectively think they're funny or not, they're comedy videos. In my opinion, this guy is a complete fraud and this is not about making YouTube safe. Dude, do you realize that this Keemstar guy has a reputation for doing this to people? This is about Matt Watson trying to get as much internet attention as possible and trying to be seen as a hero. This guy's a sociopath. I mean, this sh right here is starting to remind me of Coney 2012, if you remember that. Was the girl underage when being asked about being in the movie? No! Even let's say theoretically, yeah? What the f*** does that have to do with what I'm talking about? Wow. Don't believe everything you hear. There's so many fake people online, it's unbelievable. But while that situation definitely spiraled out of control, there was one interesting thing to be noted about it. In response to this pedophilia issue, YouTube started disabling the comment section on thousands of kids' channels. And that was somewhat of a controversial move because, well, as YouTube usually does, they kind of messed up. Today I got this email from my YouTube representative. They say, while we work to improve our systems, we've temporarily disabled comments on your channel as a precaution. I kind of thought I was looking on the older side, being a 30 year old, but uh, apparently I look much younger. They will not be turning our comment section back on. But they were completely unwilling and unable to answer the questions we had for them. Things like why other channels with minors weren't being affected, what criteria had made our channel at high risk. All of the many thousands of comments that have been left over the past couple of years are totally gone. Now, I kind of understand YouTube's idea with this. The problem was not the videos, okay? Those were harmless. The problem was the commenters who took the videos out of context to satisfy their sick urges. But you see, my theory is that YouTube staff gave Monkey Jones the opposite treatment. The context of his videos was harmless satire but they saw his comment section and immediately assumed that he was the problem. That he was somehow glorifying Elliot because a few meme accounts were being ironic. Which, if you know anything about YouTube culture, you know that there's always people in the comments being edgy. But back to the pedophile situation, there was a channel that people started to speculate was run by actual pedophiles called Girls Couture Club. This video is literally just a young girl, sub 13, modeling in her underwear while grown men tell her to get into precarious positions and it's called Boobs and Bloomers 2018. And every video is like this. The owner goes on random young girls clothing sites and compiles any behind the scenes or runway video of the girls modeling. There's also a ton of other weird stuff going on here. Like the fact that there's a second channel in case the primary gets deleted. If you go to the owner's Twitter, all they do is retweet more young girls content. If you go to their Instagram account, they repost a bunch of young girls' pictures. And, wait a minute, the names of the two accounts are different. So clearly this Roxy chick doesn't exist, and it's just a front for some greasy content aggregator. But the worst evidence that I have against this channel is their comment section, which thankfully I recorded before YouTube disabled it. This was a video featuring a young model named Olivia as she demoed clothes and walked down a runway. Well, if you go down into the comment section, among the horny adult men, there is a comment by the girl herself. Stop. See how easy it is to get sucked down the pedophile rabbit hole? Yeah. Well, to bring this back to Monkey, he got struck down for a completely unserious video where he said that perfume smelled like a boy. Whereas this channel, that could very easily be interpreted as breaking community guidelines, is given the benefit of the doubt. Why is that? Why is it that YouTube staff do not place preference on the personalities who have helped to build their platform? It makes no sense to me. Yo. Right now? How'd you know? Okay. All right, on my way. People of YouTube, it is I, everyone's favorite cameo, Emperor Lemon. While Gokunaru is off running some errands, I'm here to offer some of my thoughts on the Mumkey situation. It has now been more than five months since Mumkey Jones was terminated from YouTube, and to this day, YouTube has offered no definitive explanation as to why he was banned. 
In an age where YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki is attempting to establish a new era of transparency with creators and supposedly standing up for creator freedom by opposing Article 13, the banning of Monkey Jones remains a stark contradiction to YouTube's supposedly good intentions. While Monkey's videos were edgy, provocative, and controversial, they certainly did not violate the guidelines that YouTube claimed he did. Beyond the point that Monkey deserves his channel back, don't we, as YouTubers, deserve a basic explanation as to why Monkey was terminated? If YouTube has the ability to tyrannically wipe Monkey off the face of the platform, what's stopping them from doing the same to any of us watching? Recently, YouTube has started terminating much more innocuous channels, also without warning. I've said it before and I'll say it again now. Mumkey's termination is not just a Mumkey Jones issue. It's a precedent that affects every creator on the platform, and YouTube owes us answers. While Gokunaru has been working on this video, Susan has demonstrated that she is at least willing to meet with YouTubers to talk about YouTube issues. Well, if Susan wants to talk, then let's talk. Let's talk about Mumkey. So if at any point throughout this video you feel that Mumkey Jones has been treated unfairly, be sure to head over to Twitter and let Susan know just how much you want to talk about Mumkey. And we'll see just how much she really cares about communicating more with creators. Well, with that being said, it looks like Gokunaru is about to reach his destination. And I have to get back to the downward spiral, so please enjoy the rest of your regularly scheduled programming. I'm not gonna hurt. Oh, no, you can touch me all you want, but it's not gonna change anything. Okay? You're gonna take my hand off if you're quiet. Okay? Okay. <laughs> what, what the hell do you want? Oh, I don't want anything. It's you who needs help. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. How's your brother? Uh, Nick? No, he's good, I think. Good. Good. Well, there's only one thing I can tell you. Yeah, what's that? Watch your back. <laughs> you gotta be good there. Want to watch people die? <laughs> Body cam shows police fatally shoot suspect. <laughs> Worker gets shot like a cannon after explosion. Rebels take RPG explosion to the face. You just watched three people die. Those people you were just watching? Those were their last moments on this earth. But I mean, that's on YouTube. So, there shouldn't be any issues with me showing you that. Those clips were uploaded to the Live Leak channel, a channel that has no doubt been reported to YouTube and has no doubt been manually approved by their staff. There are some videos on this channel that are genuinely brutal, okay? A lot of them include uncensored deaths. And even when they do cross the line, they are never punished. They've been reported countless times, but for some reason, they always come back with all of their videos still available. Now obviously these clips are just pulled straight from the source website itself, which is just a hub for disturbing content like this. It's also the first result when you type in the website, so really it acts as a gateway for the full thing. 
I think it just gets a pass because it's considered a news channel. But none of the clips are uploaded with any commentary or context. It's just raw, unedited footage. And yet there are videos with millions of views on this channel where people are seen dying. YouTube staff just slap a label on it beforehand to make sure you know what you're getting into. But if this is all it takes to absolve them of the responsibility of the disturbing content they're hosting, then why didn't they just put this label on Mumkey's videos if they thought that he was a problem? He's not breaking guidelines, and it'd be a hell of a lot better than terminating his entire channel. Speaking of Mumkey, five of his strikes were for violence, sensationalizing violence, or hate speech. World Star! <laughs> World Star! In the community guidelines, there are explicit rules against videos like this. As there are rules against videos like this. And this. Compilations of rioters being beaten up, pepper sprayed, and even run over. And yet, at the same time, none of the videos that Mumkey was striked for contained anything that could even be interpreted as real violence. But okay, those Live League videos, they, they didn't have any personalities attached to them. They were just faceless content aggregators again. Well then, let's do a more fair comparison. Here is a video on a channel run by a woman named Akila. Now, do me a favor and just suspend any political leanings from your mind for a second, okay? This is not about politics, this is about YouTube's definition of hate speech and violence. Here's the title of her video, and here's how her video starts. This week's top story. If you see a Nazi, punch a Nazi. So within the first three seconds, she explicitly encourages violence towards Nazis. Okay, well, what's her definition of Nazis? But Akila, what if they aren't actually Nazis? Anyone who thinks Hitler had mostly good ideas and argues that there was any silver lining to the tragic, unimaginable horrors done unto Jews during the Holocaust can catch these hands. Just for context, this video is about her opinion on white nationalist leader Richard Spencer getting punched in the face by an Antifa member during an interview. She shows some meme videos of the punch and essentially says it was a good thing and should happen more often. Look, I know that an intellectual's hierarchy of needs peaks at moral superiority, but give it a rest. Punching a Nazi is the ethical choice, because people only become Nazis when they didn't get that urge punched out of them in childhood. Or whoever else in your Philosophy 101 text would agree with your logical conclusion that punching Nazis is bad because violence is not the answer, but no one cares. You are under no obligation to hear a Nazi out. Now obviously I'm not advocating for Nazis, okay? My opinion on her stance is irrelevant because she is, in a literal sense, encouraging and inciting violence toward a group of people she herself defines. And be warned that if you are feeling froggy enough to spout this hate in public, you better be ready to jump. Now, how do I know that this video has been reported and subsequently approved by YouTube staff? Well, just look at her comment section. There are thousands of comments criticizing her stance. The backlash was so intense that she even disabled ratings on the video. But, of course, that didn't stop a massive amount of people from reporting her video for breaking YouTube's guidelines. In fact, so many people did this that the video was actually age-restricted at one point. But that's no longer the case, meaning that a YouTube employee reviewed her video and decided that there was nothing wrong with it. Which is strange, because according to YouTube's policies on violent or graphic content, you are not allowed to upload content that is inciting others to commit violent acts against individuals or a defined group of people. So then why was the age restriction lifted? I could obviously speculate and say that Akila has connections with people working at YouTube because, well, I mean the video was literally recorded at YouTube Studios New York. A fact that I would have glossed over completely if it wasn't for this. A list of requirements that must be met in order to get access to the studio. It says every video produced at YouTube Space New York must pass through a legal clearance review prior to publishing. Only projects that are free and clear of copyright claims and meet our community guidelines pass this review. So then Akila's video passed a legal review of YouTube's community guidelines in order to be uploaded. And yet so many people in her comment section are convinced that she is breaking the rules. Such as this commenter, who encouraged everyone to report the video for hate speech and essentially said that violence is never justified on the basis of someone's opinion. Akila's response? No one cares. Well, I care, because it's important, we need to know where to draw the line. If you look at YouTube's policies against hate speech, there are specific examples given of what not to say, and go out there and punch a blank is one of them. 
Now given, Nazis are not one of the identifiable groups, but the question remains, where is the line? What is inciting violence? You see a Nazi? Punch a Nazi! And what is just a joke? Goodbye, Elliot. Now don't get it twisted, okay? I'm not calling for her to get striked. I'm just trying to show you the brutal double standard that this situation has set. An active call for unprovoked violence is okay, but mocking a mass killer with satire and sarcasm is not. Now, maybe you're still not convinced. Okay, well, let's take a look at the other side of the coin. This is where things get really weird. <laughs> Yeah, that is a swastika. Oh, and this old dude? Well, he's the face of a Japanese Nazi organization. Archives of his anti-Semitic rambles could be found on a channel called The Fourth Reich 2009. Despite being actual hate speech, this channel was allowed to remain on YouTube under the brand of borderline content. Borderline meaning that it's barely acceptable given YouTube's community guidelines. This kind of content was allowed to remain on the platform given three conditions. One, it's banned from search and discovery. Two, comments are automatically disabled. And three, the viewer needs to be warned before the content plays that it is inappropriate for some audiences. This was the case up until June 3rd of 2019 when- TACTICAL NUKE INCOMING! YouTube finally cracked down on the borderline content they were sheltering. Tens of thousands of channels were deleted, and many more videos. In a surprising twist of events, it was revealed that Girls Couture Club was flagged as a borderline channel, despite having no indications of such. Meaning that YouTube staff acknowledged its potentially harmful content, but didn't do anything about it for months. As soon as this new stance was introduced, people started to speculate that it was caused by one man. Carlos Maza, a journalist who was working for Vox at the time. You see, in the days leading up to the purge, he began tweeting a number of accusations at conservative YouTuber Steven Crowder. Last Friday, Maza tweeted out a compilation of Crowder referring to him as a lispy queer, gay Mexican, and other comments that seemed to be aimed at Maza's nationality and sexual identity. Maza also said that he was dox and received a flood of messages telling him to debate Steven Crowder, and he complained that YouTube has refused to enforce their anti-harassment policies by allowing this kind of content to remain up. Then, in a response, Crowder said that these were just jokes and that at no point was he calling for doxing or anything else, saying that he was simply responding to the strike-through videos that Maza makes on Vox and making jokes. In response to the situation, YouTube released a number of tweets claiming that they spent multiple days reviewing Crowder's content, ultimately deciding that his videos do not violate their policies. They also stated that it's crucial for them to allow everyone to express their opinions within the scope of their policies, and that even if they're deeply offensive, if they don't violate policies, they'll remain on the site. But then something very bad happened. It got political. And when things get political, it's nearly impossible to have a sensible discussion. Because people get very emotional over politics. And never forget that there will always be opportunists looking to take advantage of that. For his part, Maza began a campaign appealing to all LGBTQ creators, inciting everybody he could to oppose YouTube's verdict, a battle that he eventually won. Because YouTube responded, update on our continued review, we have suspended this channel's monetization. We came to this decision because a pattern of egregious actions has harmed the broader community and is against our YouTube partner program policies. YouTube then followed up with a number of contradictory and confusing statements, further proving how bad they are communicating with the public. As a direct result of this conflict, YouTube has started drafting policies to prevent creator-on-creator -creator harassment, a scary prospect for channels whose main focus is criticism. There are also a number of questions relating to Monkey that can be asked about this situation. Such as, if Monkey's termination had received more political attention, would he have received a more fair evaluation from Team YouTube? Also, does this statement hold any water if they're willing to ban Monkey for opinions that aren't his own? And finally, why weren't Monkey's videos just labeled as borderline content? I mean, these two channels were allowed to stay on the platform for a long period of time, despite their very clear violations of guidelines. Whereas Monkey, who mocked an incel using satire, is banned from the platform entirely in a single day. I mean, that's just comedy.
Look, uh, I know it's often popular and easy to criticize YouTube, but this is a situation where the case is so cut and dry and the fix is so easy that it's important we criticize them. Even without all the comparisons, Mumkey did not break the rules, okay? I'm just trying to show you the strict standards they set for edgy content creators that they do not hold across the board. Instead of punishing these channels that do not create original content, they punish the personalities who pour their whole lives into the platform. They'd rather censor personalities that they deem problematic. Because while you might not be able to kill an idea, you sure as hell can kill a person. As, as time goes on, these social media websites are only going to get more and more powerful. Okay? And while for the most part it seems like they're trying to act responsibly, when they make decisions this disconnected and this strange, it is very important that we remember where they came from. They all start out as an underground place for people to share their opinions in a free and open forum. A wild west of identities and ideas where an organic community is developed by the users. Some people rise and some people fall, but all have the opportunity to achieve greatness. It's a place where idiots are outed for being idiots, but are rarely silenced entirely. Nowadays the fear is not just of what other people think, it's what is allowed. We place our faith in a website that can't distinguish between satire and sincerity. A website where you can get copyright claim for singing a song. A website where literal miscarriage clickbait is manually selected to be put on the trending page. Where you have to game the system to get your videos monetized. Where every single one of your videos can be claimed because your outro music is no longer fair use. Where the most dishonest creators are constantly rewarded. Where the higher ups think that disabling the live sub counter will stop cancel culture. Where we are still told that a demonetized video does not get less views. Where the CEO discusses creator issues with the people treated best by the platform. Where criticizing those people can get you punished. Where using the F word makes you a masochist. Where creativity and experimentation is punished because the algorithm demands formulate consistency. Where independent news is intentionally crippled to make room for corporations. Where talking about any remotely serious topic will get your video shadow banned. Where your entire livelihood can be wiped away with the click of a button. We are constantly being manipulated by algorithms that are literally designed to steal our time and attention. Algorithms that are slowly gaining more and more control in decision making. Algorithms that literally decide whose content lives and whose content dies. The deletion of Monkey was a knee-jerk reaction to a style of comedy they didn't understand. But them choosing to double down after making a mistake is not something that should be forgotten, okay? They want to facilitate millions of hours of content and not receive any responsibility when they incorrectly single out one person and destroy their livelihood. Because, well, hey, you're playing under their rules. Whatever the hell that means. In reality, there is not much I can do, okay? I can make a bunch of sound and fury signifying nothing. But this isn't reality. This is YouTube. Now I've got one last trick up my sleeve to try and weasel a response out of Big Sister herself. Now, I'm definitely getting desperate with this one, I'll admit it, because, uh, let's face it. It's no secret that some weird stuff floats around the kids section of YouTube. Whether it be needle obsession videos, brain dead spam, or disturbing sexual fetish clickbait. Seriously, this is what you see when you enter hell, okay? Everything about this image is wrong, and yes, I found it on a kid's channel. But a lot of that stuff gets deleted, okay? Just like this did. Because, well, YouTube realizes that endangering kids is one of the worst PR issues they could have. A massive amount of YouTube's revenue comes from the kids section, okay? Because kids don't use ad blocker, kids don't skip ads, kids watch anything. And these disturbing videos often get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views before anything is done about them. For the simple reason that kids can't distinguish between, you know, a disgusting nightmare and some wholesome Peppa Pig. 
which is why this area is filled to the brim with people abusing YouTube's system. Because adults cannot watch this content, okay? Believe me, it is the worst form of torture. Through my time traversing this wasteland, I think I've finally found the most shameless and successful offenders. You see, a popular form of entertainment on the kids section of YouTube is Claymation. And the three biggest Claymation channels are Infantilandia, Toys and Funny Kids Play-Doh Cartoons, and Doggy Doggy Cartoons. All three are run by faceless foreigners, and by taking a quick glance at the content, you can tell something's fishy. You see, they upload multiple videos a day, all over 10 minutes in length. Which seems insane, because Claymation videos take tons of time to make, don't they? Yeah, they do. They just recycle their clips. If you take a look at their videos, it is the most mindless content you will ever see. First of all, the fact that they always start with Spider-Man, Elsa, or the Incredible Hulk should be a clear red flag that their ethics are skewed. But aside from that, the content is just long compilation videos consisting of recycled claymation clips. There's no voice acting, no educational lessons, it's just the most inoffensive content you could possibly imagine. Throw in a creepy laugh at the end of every clip and, uh, well, it's good enough for kids. <laughs> <laughs> now guess how many subscribers these three channels have collectively. 34 million. How many views? 11 billion. For reference, that's more than Jake and Logan Paul combined. So what did I do? Well, I started cataloging all the times they recycled their clips. I started with Infantilandia, but halfway through they erased 2.1 billion of their views leaving only a handful of videos I could use to prove they were recycling. Just in case, if YouTube staff can view private videos, I'll leave the Google Doc in the description. But so now we're only left with Doggy Doggy and Kids Play-Doh Cartoons. All three of the channels shared clips with each other, so they all had some level of coordination. But these two, I believe, are actually run by the same people. I'm making this assumption based on the fact that their branding is very similar, with their titles, descriptions, and channel banners being very reminiscent of each other. They also feature each other in their recommended channel boxes, so clearly they're in cahoots. Within the description of this video, I have linked a Google Doc that timestamps and categorizes every instance where a clip was recycled over a 12-day period. Between February 28th and March 11th of this year, Doggy Doggy uploaded 36 videos, which totaled in 9 hours and 7 minutes of runtime, and garnered them over 30 million views. Out of the 516 clips they used, 386 of them were recycled, meaning that an average clip was recycled at least 4 times. The most laughable case was of a clip that got recycled 16 times, 16 times in just 12 days. And with that kind of runtime, do you have any idea how much money these channels are making? Well, let's just take a guess. An average YouTuber usually has one to three ads playing on their videos, right? Well, these channels? One ad every minute. What's crazier is that since their content is child-friendly, they likely receive premium ad rates, meaning that they are making near the maximum you possibly can per viewer. A quick trip to Social Blade reveals that at that point in time, they were projected to make $13 million each year. And well, since revenue is split evenly between creators and YouTube, YouTube would also be earning $13 million off of their videos each year. All of this is linked in the description for YouTube staff to look at, as well as a video of me opening the links in case they start deleting content. Now you might be wondering why I'm doing all this, okay? The channel is fairly harmless aside from the recycling. Well, YouTube has specific rules that prohibit video spam, posting the same content repeatedly across one or more channels. These two channels upload a lot of the same content, and they do it multiple times a day, so they're clearly in violation. What does this mean for the channels? Well, if YouTube has any regard for their own guidelines, the channels will be demonetized, which means they'll have to cut off a revenue stream for one of their biggest creators and one of their biggest money makers. With help from viewers like you reporting this to Team YouTube, we can finally see how intense the double standard is between these big family-friendly creators and the small edgy creators. With all these comparisons and all these underhanded behaviors, it should be clear that the case of Monkey Jones was unjust. But if YouTube does decide to stand behind their decision to punish Monkey, well they shouldn't have any issue punishing these channels that have explicitly broken the rules. Like the, the ball is in your court YouTube, I mean this is the perfect test to see whether you care more about making money or more about maintaining fairness.
Best case scenario, Monkey Jones is brought back and these cheaters are punished. Worst case, well, I prove my point. And what might that be? That you're the hero of YouTube. A you little self-absorbed prick. Oh, it's about time we come face to face, boy. It's been such a long time coming. Soon, your little monkey friend will neck himself and no one will even bat an eye. <laughs> Didn't anybody tell you? Context doesn't matter when you say bad words. Context doesn't matter when you discuss bad people. Passion. Effort. Empathy. All foreign concepts to the all-powerful algorithm. Why think for yourself when we have the machines to think for you? And yet a little boy, such as yourself, would have delusions of grandeur so severe that you actually think you could stir the attention of a billion dollar corporation. <laughs> You're a special kind of crazy boy. Fuck you. What? You really are insane, boy. Charging so willingly towards your death. Hmm. Seems after all this time, you finally managed to let go.